turn in our hymnals to page 430. 430. This will be an offertory hymn. going to be reading from Genesis, the first chapter, verses 26 through 28. You can find them in your Bible there. You can find it at page what? Somebody tell me. Two? Page two of the Pew Bible. And uh, then you find it on that sheet that you picked up. Some of you may have picked up on the way in. Genesis, the first chapter, the 26th through the 28th verse. And God said, let us make man in our image, after his likeness, after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air 
and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. A lot of subjects tied up in that in those three verses. A lot of subjects. Male and female created he them. He does the creation of it. Wouldn't that be a good topic for a sermon right now? Wouldn't it be a good topic for a sermon for us to see that we have dominion over the fish and the fowl and the, and, and the uh, animals that roam the earth? That's a good subject. But I want to talk to you about a subject that is a little, to me, it's something been on my mind. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. I want to share something with you. It's been a long time ago that this happened. I was pastor at, uh, at Tarrytown, Georgia and for five years and teaching at Bruton Parker uh, also. And during those five years, Tarrytown's about like Crossland, but Tarrytown uh, had two new businesses to come to town. And I had experiences with both of them. One was a restaurant. <laughs> and they had on that, in that, on that menu, they, they had on Saturday, on Friday night, they had fish. And on Saturday night, they had barbecue. And uh, they were struggling to find out what to do on, on Thursday night. And finally, he said, you know, a lot of people eat chitlins. I think we're going to have chitlin night on Friday, on Thursday night. Guess which night I did not go. <laughs> That's another sermon. But the other, other place was a, was a junk place. They put junk. And you go to take that junk, and you take it home, and you do a lot of things with it to make your house look better, your yard look better, whatever you could use that piece of junk for. And when I was going by there, walking by there down to the post office one day, I noticed that somebody had left an old horse-drawn sickle mower. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever driven one of those or not, but I did because I, I had, Daddy wanted me to learn how to cut the hay. And so he bought a horse-drawn sickle mower that where the wheels, as they turned, would run the blades, and the blades would, would cross one another like this. And it's a long thing on the side you let down and go, go sweeping through the field to cut the hay. I, I stopped there for just a moment, and I looked at that and reminisced about my life and about how God had called me and uh, to reap, because that's what he wanted us to do. Who will go into my fields and reap, he said. But I also thought, uh, thought something else about that moor, that in all probability, that moor would never be used as a moor again, because we have much more efficient and faster machines than that horse-drawn sickle mower was. So it was just sitting there. And I knew that somebody, somewhere, would buy that old sickle mower and probably put it in the, in the front yard with that, with that uh, blade standing straight up about six or eight feet tall. I knew that that was what was going to happen to that. But then I thought a little bit more how, how that sick about that. Man was made in God's image. And that image in us no longer functions as it was intended to function. That sickle more never functioned again like it was supposed to. 
doing what it was supposed to do. God created us in his image. And then what did we do? What did Adam and Eve do that you and I have done as well? We decided that we could do things better than God could do it, so we went our own way. And we, did, we went against his will. And sin entered the world. I'm, I'm using the pronoun we for Adam and Eve because I think Adam and Eve and it, it, you, the mother and father of us all, that's we. That's part of us. But what in the world does the image of God mean? What does it mean? There are some people who say that it means a physical likeness, that it that they say that God is basically physical and has a shape that like I have. And, oh, better, maybe I should have gotten somebody else with that to say, but has a shape like all of us in here have. The Bible has a good deal to say about God being different from us. It has a lot to say. Because Jesus told the woman at the well, that God is spirit, and they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is not like us with the face we have, with our nose and hands and all of that that we have. He's not like that at all. He's spirit. David was so, or rather Isaiah was so caught up in the majesty of God that he saw that there was a difference when he said, his thoughts are not our thoughts. David said that he knows our thoughts, every thought that we have. So God is not like us in that fashion, or we are not like God in that fashion. But no man has seen God at any time. It's what John tells us in John 1. Moses had the unique opportunity. God said to him, and he was the only person that I know of, he said to him on one occasion, let me see you and I can believe you. And he said, I'll put you in this crevice. I'll put my hand over you. And when I walk by, I'll remove my hand. And you can see my, in the King James, hinder parts, my backside. That's all he got to see. So we can't paint God in a picture even though we can represent him as a hand giving life to Adam as in this picture over here. Some people say that the image is a person's reasoning power and it's true that this seems to separate us from animals. For only man buys life insurance. Get that. No donkey buys life insurance. No snake buys life insurance. If he did, there's one that needs collection right now at our house. I just wanted you to know that we reason and we all look ahead and we think, what's going to happen if I die to my family? So we buy life insurance as we're looking ahead. The Old Testament says that we should reason together with God. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, so that your sins would be as white as snow. And they will be clean, a red like crimson. And the New Testament says, us, says to us that we ought to have the mind of Christ and reason as Christ reasons. But human personhood involves more than mind. It involves emotions because you cry and you laugh. It involves will because you get a clash of wheels in your family sometime between the mama and the daddy and the mama and the child and the daddy and the child. You get a clash because there's will in all of us. 
and because of social elements that we have. We need to be together. Human beings need company every once in a while. The image of God in persons is the potentiality, the ability, and the responsibility to respond to God and to yourself and to others. The image of God that you were created in. How is this image going to be portrayed? What happened to this image? The image was altered by the fall. You don't look like God. God doesn't look like you. There's no human being in the world who looks completely like you or who has fingers, fingers just like you. You're unique. You're in the image of God. Joy Roberts is in the image of God. Randall is in the image of God. And he towers over every one of us in here. Who and what does the fall mean? When we sinned, and we all sinned with Adam, and when we sinned, we fell from God. And without the fall, the rest of the Bible makes no sense at all. For instance, no fall, and there's no redemption. And we know Jesus and we've been redeemed, right? No sin, no salvation. Adam and Eve refused to respond with obedience to God. After he created them, he put them in the, fee, in, the, uh, in the garden and he told them to till the garden. But I want to share another little thing, little tidbit from the news that I picked up just this week from this. We have not followed what he said as far as having children. Listen to this. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And we have not done that. My generation bit, bit into the... The idea that two people, two children, make an ideal family. God said, fill up the earth. What's happening in the world today? This is the news that I got. China will be a force until she ages to death because that's what's happening. She is losing population like crazy because they don't have children. They only had one, remember? Russia is aging to death right now. Aging. What about America, you say? Our, our birth rate, including the people coming across the border, our birth rate, is 1.86 in the family. What does that mean? That means that we are losing population even with millions coming across the southern border. I'm going to tell you, I know that there are some people who can't have children. But my, fam my generation, my family, me, I thought we could just replace ourselves and everything would be all right. Guess what? Our young'uns are not going to be able to pay our Social Security. You think about all of this. In the image of God, did we have reason? Yes, we had reason. But we have denied ourselves of being, of seeing God and God in his image. What did those 
Adam and Eve do. In guilt, they hid from God. And that same dilemma is ours today. We try to hide our weaknesses from everybody we can, everybody we have. And we have secrets in our minds that we're not going to tell anybody. We hide even now because of what we have done and said. We try to deceive ourselves about who we are and how we feel and where we have failed. We throw them out. Our fall separates us from a good relationship that God intended for us to have with others. Like I said just a moment ago, we need to come to church to see each other. We need to have company because that's the way God created us. Did you notice what he said? Let us make men in our own image and after our likeness. He is talking only about himself like the Queen of England does when she talks about we do so and so and so and so and she's the only person she's referring to. That's called the royal, the royal pronoun. And God is using the royal pronoun here, but in far, as far as you and I are concerned, he belongs to us. You see, Adam blamed Eve for her sin, for the sin. Eve blamed the snake for her sin. And you and I still do the same thing. We blame others because of what they are. And the fall is also the denial of responsibility. God said to them, when he placed them in the garden, you can have anything you want to eat in this garden except one thing. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when you do, you will die. That's the fall. The fall is a denial of the responsibility that we have. But denying that responsibility does not remove the fact of our responsibility. It only distorts our image that we place ourselves in from God. The results of sin in the fall, man's totally depraved. I want you to know that. And by totally depraved, I define it differently from what a lot of other people do. A lot of other people say totally depraved means that you are totally evil and that you, there's no way in the world you're going to hell unless God does, that chooses you to come. No, God didn't leave it like that. I'll get into that another time. The results of our sin is that we're totally depraved. That means total of all of us are depraved. We sin. And we are depraved. All of our being is affected by our fall. Our reason is affected. Our will is affected. Our emotions are affected. And this depravity means that we cannot find God unless he takes the initiative. If, you've, if you're here today and you came to know Jesus Christ as your Savior the Holy Spirit spoke to you inside your heart. And you came to the front of the church where you were, and you knew something had happened between you and God inside your heart. The beauty of the gospel is this, that God's own image came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And that was Jesus Christ. That is all that we have that can save us. Jesus came to this earth and he lived without sin. He got angry, but he did not sin. Paul says, be angry and sin not. Jesus got angry, but he didn't sin. He's both man and he's God. He is God in that he communed with God in alone in prayer time 
way off from where his disciples were. He was man because he loved to have a fish fry. Guys, that fish fry we have on Saturday nights sometime, that's the same thing Jesus had. In fact, he fried the fish that the disciples had after he was raised from the dead on the beach. Bring me some fish. I've got some going. Bring me the fish. He knew that he was man. He knows he's God. He is in the image of God. And he's capable of restoring the sheltered image, shattered image, rather, of God in every person who will confess him as son of God. Every person. That doesn't mean every person is going to live like you want them to live. That doesn't mean that you can stack up all your things and on one side that are good, and if he does all that, that's okay, and if he never does any of this, that's better. We're not even talking about that. All we talk about is what Paul said, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. He did not say one single don't. You ever thought about that? Now, there are things that we or Christians don't do because it's going to mar the image of God in us. And it's going to mar the name of our God in heaven. And you know, somehow, I think that's probably the reason that the United States is having such trouble today because we don't say that God is pure and holy. And if you want to go there, you do like, just like Billy Graham used to say on television, you pronounce that Jesus is God's son and you pronounce that God raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. That's it. You know what happens then? The image of God in us is being rebuilt remodeled so that whenever we lie on our deathbed and we dread what's coming, we see only the hand of God reaching down to take us back home with him. Isn't that a wonderful picture? God loved us twice. He loved us to create us. He loved us to bring us back to him. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we're so grateful for who you are and for the fact that you loved us enough to make us, to let our bodies be knitted and formed in our mother's womb. You knew us even then before we came into this world. And I pray that you would let all of us in this place recognize that you are our Father. And only thing we have to do is to accept the Lord Jesus and his image in us and to say to you and to confess to others that Jesus was raised from the dead. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.